Get ready. Uh, good, happy day after, everyone. Yesterday was uh, Charka Jayanti. Charka is the Hindi word for wheel, and especially for the spinning wheel. And uh, it's, of course, the day on which uh, Gandhi was born in 1869, and the country wanted to name that day Gandhi Jayanti, Gandhi's birthday, and he said, no, name it after the spinning wheel. So that I don't think actually stuck. I don't think all India grinds to a halt on October 2nd, but uh, that's how we remember the day. I uh, hope you read that uh, we have a Nobel Prize in physics uh, here at Berkeley. Professor Smoot, we're eagerly awaiting the Nobel Prize in nonviolence to be announced. <laughs> We are just a tiny bit behind our original schedule, but that's fine. And we're going to talk about the early years in India. And I kind of suggested that we divide that into two phases, a little bit like the South Africa career, uh, where we go down to about 1924, 1925 when Gandhi is in prison and things slow down a little bit, but really not that much. And then the final uh, crisis of the freedom struggle with the climaxes in 1930, 31, and then the, f the Quit India movement. And we'll talk a little bit about the demoralizing aftermath of partition and so forth, but not a lot because uh, it would be slightly – it would be slightly a bummer. I had a French professor at NYU who uh, went on for hours and hours about this elaborate theory about Camus. <laughs> And then she said, but we will ignore this theory because it is dull. So similarly, we won't dwell on that too much. But I'm going to sort of run through things twice, and I hope that's not too confusing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off after saying – making a few announcements actually and saying a bit about uh, um, the background in India. I'm going to run through his description of the five satyagrahas that are in his introduction to Satyagraha in South Africa. And that's on the pages 185, the following of your reader. And then I'm going to uh, go back and do it chronologically and then fill in some of the other events. So I hope that isn't too confusing. A um, couple of announcements. Uh, the Prime Minister of India, Manmohan Singh, has just been to South Africa where he talked to President Mbeki. And uh, was talking to him about the fact that their nation's destinies are joined by Gandhi's career in South Africa and its, its influence on the eventual resolution of apartheid and, and suggested that the two nations cooperate around a Gandhian <coughs> legacy. It's a fantastic idea. It's a wonderful thing. So that happened in Durban yesterday. Uh, and that'll be actually a good segue into one of our things because Manmohan Singh, as you can tell from his name, is not Hindu exactly. He's a Sikh and one of the early movements in the whole freedom struggle. Two, or two of the really early movements did not come directly from the Hindu community. The one was a Khilafat struggle that involved the uh, Indian Muslims as well as other Muslims. And then there was a small but very dramatic affair known as the Affair of the Keys in 1920, which was uh, the Sikh community in Amritsar. Um, at Stanford, if you will permit me to mention it, on uh, the day of our midterm, October 19th, that evening at 7.30 and the following day, there's a big, big symposium on humanity after Abu Ghraib. <laughs> you know, you Somebody said poetry after Auschwitz would be obscene and uh, I, this is about, you know, is there humanity after Abu Ghraib. They tend – this is a Stanford educational extension uh, <coughs> under the care of Mark Gunnerman. They tend to do very, very good conferences down there. So that will be the 19th and 20th. Okay, just a little observation and then we can get started. The little observation is – as you know, I never – almost never go to see movies unless there's a specific reason to do so and then I usually regret it. But this weekend, I went to Dallas and back. Uh, I like trips to be successful and short. 
and this was both. Uh, but this means four hours out, four hours back, and I'm, I can't be writing on my laptop all the time. So I do glance up at the screen and I see these two movies and it's, this is really the good way to see them without the sound. So you can really tell the subtext, the imagery that's being imprinted in people's minds. On, on one level it was interesting because the outbound movie was a Latino movie and the inbound movie was a uh, gringo movie. They were like exactly the same movie except the gringo movie was high tech and they had Star Wars and things like that and all kinds of fantastical equipment and the Latino movie was very – it involved more like burros and uh, pe people harvesting mesquite with machetes and things like that. But that aside, it was exactly the same movie and both of them were appallingly violent and appallingly childish. And I think if you were listening to the sound and got caught up, you might not notice that. But I never do that. I'm so smart. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and this is partly as a result uh, – where is Sid? I know you're here. There you go. Uh, it's partly as a result of your question last week about how do we get this into American culture which doesn't have the advantages uh, that Gandhi had. And I insisted that it is possible to do it but I'm still trying to work out how. And I have to say after seeing these films, I have an even more grim sense of how difficult it is going to be. Because if we got 300 million people in the country, I'd say probably 295 million of them are living in an extremely dangerous fantasy. At the emotional age of about nine. It, we, last time I saw a study on this, the emotional age of the average television program was emotional and cognitive was about 12 and that was some years ago. We've been going downhill ever since. <coughs> so there is a sense in which when things get worse, it's easier for them to get better because nobody wants to stay in this box. They want to break out and it's at this point I think I'll introduce – if I haven't already done so, if I have, I apologize – introduce a famous testimonial about Gandhi by Arnold Toynbee, the British historian who said, uh, he, Gandhi, made it impossible for us to go on ruling India but he made it possible for us to leave without rancor and without humiliation. So I think these are – this is our job. This is our operation. This is our marching orders. We've got to figure out what nonviolence is and then figure out how to pitch it to people who are half asleep and I'm going to read a Gandhian comment on that also without rancor and without humiliation. Uh, not that it wouldn't be satisfying to be rancorous and, and disrespectful. If on one level it would be emotionally satisfying for us. But we're not into this for emotional satisfaction. We're into this to get it done and, and in that regard, uh, making them feel bad, uh, even angrier than they are, even more embarrassed than they already are and they are embarrassed without realizing it would only make it more difficult to get them to change. So I really think of this as kind of our uh, – it's the banner under which we're operating here. It's why we're learning this stuff. We have to think about it on two levels and that's why we're looking so closely into Gandhi's career. All right. So we had barely gotten Gandhi back to India and he did not want to embarrass the British uh, – embarrass with two R's by the way uh, – because World War I was going on and that put him at odds with some of the more hot-tempered Indian nationalists. This is a period in which the concept of Indian nationalism is taking root and it's a um, – it's a tricky thing. Nationalism is. Actually, there's, there are two tricky things that Gandhi has to do. He has to awaken the people from their torpor and then get them quickly moving in a nonviolent direction so that they, they don't get violent. So he has to – in a way, he has to get them a little bit angry. But the minute they're angry, he has to give them a nonviolent thing to do with that anger. Now, similarly, uh, one of the reasons that 
in the great scheme of things Gandhi appears on the scene at this period is that India is beginning to lose its confidence, uh, confidence in itself. This can be a very, de very serious thing. It's not just emotionally demoralizing. Remember I took an anthropology course many years ago and I was taught about a phenomenon <coughs> called ritual death. Ritual death was taking place in certain communities in Africa where people were suddenly ha – had suddenly come in contact with Western civilization, an advanced technological civilization. And their whole culture suddenly didn't make sense. And some of these people went and sat down and stopped taking food and they died. This could be a matter of life and death whether you believe that the culture in which you grew up, the ancestors whom you worship, the ground on which you tread makes sense and has value in the universe. And Indians were beginning to feel that their entire civilization was a mistake. And that would be a disaster for them and for the world because we need that civilization very badly. Um, so Gandhi had to arouse pride in what India had been and what it still could be. And as a person, he succeeded in the latter because a lot of people felt you know, they had come to feel that there couldn't be a God conscious person anymore. And oh my gosh, there was one. So uh, he had to give them a sense of national pride that they were proud to be Indian. But at the same time, this was not about nationalism as opposed to, let's say, I'm you know, you see all of these SUVs and pickup trucks. At least where I live out in a little more remote area where I see all these pickup trucks with these big signs on the back that have an American flag and say, proud to be an American. Which people say that because they're ashamed to be an American. Otherwise, you don't have to put a bumper sticker <laughs> there to say, you know, the opposite. So it's this tricky thing where he had to uh, assist in the rise of a nationalistic feeling but then have it go beyond that to be a sense of pride in human accomplishment and not like India as opposed to Pakistan or India as opposed to Sri Lanka or Burma. And uh, there was an unusual character on the scene in these days who's going to figure into our story. Her name was Annie Besant. She was a, an Irish woman and a theosophist, so she had this uh, interest uh, in India's spirituality but not a terribly discriminating interest in it. So it was more like – she thought it was more like Star Wars, <laughs> occult phenomena, things like that. But she had more to do with Indian nationalism than any Indian at this early World War I period. And she'd started something called the Home Rule League, Home Rule – is basically Hind Swaraj. And she invited Gandhi to join and he declined. And uh, he will end up saying that th there is no ready-made organization with its agenda already fixed that he can join. He doesn't fit in. He's going to take <coughs> over the Indian National Congress which had no agenda at all. It basically become a talk shop. I almost said like the academic senate but actually it was probably a little bit worse than the academic senate at that point. And he took it over and this is very well done in the film. You see people just you know talking and chatting and they listen to him and they get all <coughs> turned on. Uh, he turned that into a very powerful political vehicle for himself which lasted until he was so far out that he wanted to use nonviolence to defend the country against the Japanese and they couldn't go along with him. So for 20 some, maybe 25 years, he is going to be the Indian National Congress. But he put his mold on it completely. Um, just to touch briefly on some of the remote background, we know that 1868, uh, I believe, had been the mutiny when there was an uprising that I've mentioned before it was very, very violent and the British still were nervous about the possibility of that kind of revolt. And then in 1906, Lord Curzon when he was the Viceroy had decided to partition Bengal. 
without asking the Bengalis how they felt about that. So I was trying to think of an analogy and I, it wouldn't really quite work because I was talking about creating Northern California and Southern California as two states, but I, I don't think it would involve the same passions. Uh, the Bengalis were very proud of their culture and their language and they had worked hard to get Hindus and Muslims um, in the same community. And for a foreigner to come and just chop and say, no, you're now two uh, states, two districts, was extremely offensive to them and there was almost an uprising on his hands. That had been back in uh, 1906. So Gandhi arrives on the scene and he is advised by Gokhale to famously keep your big ears open and your big mouth shut for one year. And he went along with that advice. Mm. And this is also pretty well done in the film. You see him going around on the train and you see him seeing the results of the poverty and seeing the results of the attempt to overcome this poverty by violence. And he's, he's really building up a head of steam. There's, I gather there's even a scene in the Attenborough movie which as Americans we have been protected from because we are uh, so prudish. But there's a scene I understand in which he is at the Hooghly Bridge in Bengal and he goes to wash his cloth in the river. And this is a narrow – at that point there's a woman at the other side of the river who's washing her sari and it's her only sari which was the case for many village women at that time. And so she's uh, naked to the from the waist up. That's why he – absolutely not in America. Can't see that. Uh, and Gandhi is looking at her and she's looking at him and he takes his cloth and he floats it across the river to her. It was a very eloquent gesture. So he is spending this year getting very angry. Um, I guess let me run through the satyagrahas that come up as he describes them because he has a very good feel for the development um, in the preface to Satyagraha in South Africa. So this is in your reader if you want to kind of follow along. Um, the first thing he got involved in was actually that year of probation wasn't even out yet but somebody came up to him um, that – and this is how a lot of these things started. He was going to Saurashtra which is the state the region, really district in which he was born. And uh, a man named Motilal, Baha'i Motilal comes up to him with a small party at a railroad station and complains to him about the hardships of this uh, town or district, Viramgam, and tries to enlist his help. It's a nice conversation. There was an expression of both compassion and firmness in his eyes. Are you ready to go to jail? I asked. This is probably a pretty typical question that Gandhi would ask you if you met him. Not like, you know, where are you from? What are you majoring in? <laughs> How much do you make? His interest was, are you ready to go to jail? We are ready to march to the gallows was the quick reply. Jail will do for me, Gandhi said. But see that you do not leave me in the lurch. Well, there are two things that are typical about how this begins and that is that within India, Gandhi's operations tended to follow the pattern of Svadeshi very closely, as closely as, you know, time and events would allow, meaning that he started in Gujarat state, he even started in Saurashtra, the district that he was born in and he let things grow outward from there. He will never try to operate outside of India in his whole life. So that, that should really give us pause. The other thing that's typical about this is as far as I can remember, there were only one or two episodes in the whole freedom struggle which were Gandhi's idea or just by himself. The most famous one being the Salt Satyagraha. And this was dramatized by Attenborough. You see him sitting there in the sea and suddenly goes, ah, salt. <laughs> he gets the idea. The little light bulb goes off in his head. Uh, you know, corny but uh, – 
accurate enough, that idea came to him as the way to focus, the find the climactic Satyagraha in the spring of 1930. But uh, most of the other events were kind of handed to him on a platter. People came to him with problems and this is – so this means that the miners' strike that led to the Great March in January of 1913, that that was more typical actually of the way things went. Things got started and he had to grab the opportunity rather than be planning them. And we'll see the same pattern repeated in the career of Martin Luther King where there'll be a couple of events which he'll sit down and plan with his uh, people. But most of them, uh-oh, they're suddenly happening, the most famous of which was the Greenboro uh, lunch counter sit-ins. Okay, so the issue here was that the local legislation had set up um, a travel barrier. And they weren't issuing fast passes to these bullock carts. So it actually was a pain in the neck and a huge expense and in all ways extremely galling. I mean, these are people who are not well trained the way we are. Once you've been through an airport security line, the Viramgam customs <coughs> barrier would be nothing. But they're, they're used to just wa moving freely about their own country. In fact, they're used to thinking of it as their own <coughs> country and that's, that's the problem. So this was really a hated uh, barrier and he went to Rajkot, which is a provincial capital, gets information and commenced correspondence with the government. So we're starting the same pattern that you saw in South Africa, petitioning, lit litigation and satyagraha with an undercurrent of constructive program the whole time. Uh, and you saw this sentence here, the loyal CID brought these speeches to the notice of the government. The CID is basically the same as the FBI. So it's a criminal investigation department. And whenever there were CID men in the audience, Gandhi would always invite them to sit in the front row and translate for them and make sure they could understand everything and uh, help them do their reports. <coughs> and a lot of the time, in some funny way, this actually would redound to his benefit uh, as with the banning of the Gujarati original of Hind Swaraj. So he said, okay, then I have to produce it in English translation and of course had a much wider audience. So here also the loyal CID, he's being partly sarcastic but partly not. They are loyal to what they <coughs> think they're supposed to be doing. The loyal CID brought these speeches to the notice of the government. In this they serve government and unintentionally serve the people also by raising consciousness about the event. And finally he had a talk with Lord Chelmsford who was the viceroy, I'm pretty sure. And he promised abolition of the customs line and actually did it. So he was – unlike Smuts, he – had enough power and enough honesty to follow through. And uh, I know others also tried for this, but I am strongly of opinion, Gandhi adds, that the imminent possibility of satyagraha was the chief factor in obtaining the desired redress. <coughs> so this is as close as you ever get to threat power in nonviolence. It's, uh, I've often said that even though it has the rhetoric of a threat, of an ultimatum, if you don't do this, I will have to do that. I still say it's not exactly what Boulding meant by threat power. Because with threat power, you're forcing people to do something whether they want to or not and you're threatening to hurt them if they don't. Whereas in Satyagraha, although you may be, you know, maybe a little bit inconvenient for them, you're not hurting anyone, you're actually – your motivation is to liberate them from an oppressive situation with it in which they happen to be the oppressors. So it's not exactly a threat. I hope you'll see the fine distinction there. I think it's very important. But we're going to see this pattern also again and again and again. Gandhi will go in and say he will give them an opportunity to get it. 
if they get it by themselves and they do the right thing, no one would be happier than Gandhi himself. But if they don't, he's going to have to face Satyagraha. That's what we just did with the peace pledge. You know, we told them beginning of September, you've got 21 days to come up with a plan to get out of Iraq. Strangely enough, they didn't. We had our Satyagraha. And I don't know where things were at by before I left for Texas, but uh, may you may not have heard there were 500 organizations, 375 events around the country and about 250 people arrested. That's, that's you know, one in a million. <laughs> it's about 250 million people in the country. But it was a start and it followed the same pattern. Uh, likewise, a really a famous example of this, Martin Luther King will go to President Johnson and say, we need a Voters' Rights Act. The President will say, well, you know, I'd like to myself, but I, I can't do that. We will – I'll lose the Democrats, I'll lose the South. And so King said, okay. <laughs> he went out and organized civil disobedience for six months and then came in and not only got the Voters' Rights Act, but Johnson signed it, handed Martin Luther King Jr. the pen and proceeded to sing, We Shall Overcome. It was the only time that Martin Luther King's people saw him crying in the entire civil rights movement. I mean, his – Johnson was probably not that good of a singer, but I don't think that was the reason. <laughs> okay. So then skipping down to 1917, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to a year-by-year -year thing in a bit if we run through this as Satyagraha, uh, what the city calls it, the law of progression. The next thing that came up was the Indian Emigration Act. He wanted to repeal the entire indenture system that he had struggled with directly in India. There's a lot of agitation. Um, a deputation of ladies went to the Viceroy. Uh, and here too, success came merely through preparedness for Satyagraha. Same pattern. The Viceroy knows perfectly well that people are going to launch Satyagraha if he doesn't comply. He decides to comply. Incidentally – sorry, got to interrupt myself just a second here. Uh, a few people I think were confused by my mentioning and will be mentioning it again that on one or two occasions Gandhi suspended Satyagraha. And of course what I meant by suspending Satyagraha was suspending active nonviolent resistance. This is, shall we say, Satyagraha with a small c, small s. He never suspended Satyagraha, the principle, not for one moment. I mean every breath was a clinging to truth. But there were times when you actively resisted when you pushed forward with what I call obstructive program and there were times when you did not. So that, that's what I meant. So here he's holding that in abeyance. Uh, and this would bring us down to uh, the Rowlett Acts which are starting to be passed now. Uh, it, and that will climax in 1919. But there's a comment here I wanted to share with you, a couple of them actually. Lord Chelmsford committed a series of blunders beginning with the passing of the Rowlett Act. This is what I earlier called an atrocity and it's an example of paradox of repression. In order to keep these people down, we've got to put the screws on harder. There comes a point past which when you tighten the screws, people are going to fight back. Uh, also, he says, since he, he thought that Chelmsford was a wise ruler, but what viceroy can escape for long? The influence of the permanent officials of the civil service. In other words, in a system which is basically a, a lie, it's basically structurally flawed. Namely, we need to come here from Western Europe and rule your country because you are not capable of doing it yourself and while we're at it, we're also going to loot you, but that's not really the reason. Uh, when you have that kind of system, even good individuals cannot function well. And if you remember the film A Passage to India, 
I did see that film for sure in a movie theater. Ears, the whole thing. Uh, the doctor, the Indian doctor <coughs> in that film, Dr. Aziz, he says, these Englishmen come here, they're very idealistic. I give them two years. You know, two years in this system and they'll turn into brutes. And I've read very similar comments about the criminal justice system. There are people who go into the prison system with very high ideals. I want to help people. And within a few years, they degenerate into uh, jailers. So again, for Christopher <coughs> Gandhi, he can always separate in his mind the individual from the system. He sees that pretty well. So after Viram Gam, after the Indian Im Immigration Act, which uh, is passed in 1917 and basically abolishes the indentured labor system, comes the famous Champaran struggle. Uh, and again, this w started by a nag. The nag was a young man who uh, – his name is escaping me at the moment – Rajkumar Shukla. Rajkumar Shukla. For some reason, Richard Attenborough in his artistic genius decided to make him an old man. I don't know why. But actually, Rajkumar Shukla – you remember the scene where he's wading across the river to the ashram and he says, hello, hello. <laughs> and he comes in and he t gives him this long story <laughs> about how terrible it is. And then they go and they interview the man with the flies crawling over his face. Uh, I don't know, a very good film. But anyway, in reality, Rajkumar Shukla was a young guy who stuck to Gandhi like glue and basically followed him the length and breadth of India saying, Champaran, 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 you got to come here. And so Gandhi had actually heard about this as early as 1916 in the Indian National Congress meeting of that year where Shukla first uh, went to him. And uh, finally, finally he does agree to go there. This was really a climactic event because uh, such agraha had to be offered here. The threat was not enough. And I'm going to read you just one sentence about that. Um, well, as he says here, um, powerful vested interests were arrayed in opposition. Okay, so the, the basic rule of thumb that we're following is there is no situation to which nonviolence cannot be applied. However, in some cases, it's going to work, quote unquote, the way that we want it to work in a, in a relatively straight up manner. And that happened at Viramgam and uh, about the Indian Immigration Act. But if there were powerful vested interests in the latter case, they were in South Africa. And remember, the Indian colonial government is actually using Satya using South, South Africa to sh demonstrate their humanity. Um, it's like my friend Daniel Ellsberg, he went down to Nicaragua right after the Sandinista revolution was uh, in power and they took him around to prisons and every prison that he went to, they released some of these uh, former uh, militarists who had been you know, oppressing the country. Um, under that military di – the Samoso dictatorship. And it was obviously to impress Dan. I mean, he didn't mind the guys getting out. They know they weren't going to be rearrested. It's good that they got out. But it's this funny thing where India is, is kind of pointing and saying, see, we're not South Africa. They oppress people down there. But here he was actually confronting the Raj for the first time where the shoe really pinches and that was with the land ownership and financial exploitation of the country. It's for this reason certain professors of yours, no names please, insisted that during the declaration of peace on the platform of that program was not just the removal of troops from Iraq but the removal of vested interests, corporate interests that have basically sold off the country – stolen the country 
and sold it to themselves. Unless that's gotten rid of, we're not really confronting what the system is all about. But when you confront that, that's when you're really going to meet the resistance. <coughs> so um, in April, <coughs> April 18th of 1917, he is on trial in Champaran. Um, you remember the scene with the rain pouring down outside. I refuse to pay a hundred rupees, he says. Um, if, we, if things ever really get you know, boring here, which is unthinkable, but imagine if they did, you just, just feed me a line from that movie and we'll see, I could, I could probably go about 25 minutes of dialogue. Anyway, um, he is arrested. He's been told to leave the district. And incidentally, that scene where he's sitting on an elephant and the policeman comes along on a bicycle going ring ding, ring ding. That actually happened. There was hand, you have to leave the district. And he signed on the back, I refuse, and gave it back to him. Uh, and he told the magistrate, as a law-abiding citizen, my first instinct would be, as it was, to obey the order served on me. But then he explains he couldn't do that without doing violence to the people he had come there to serve. And he states an important principle. I have disregarded the order served upon me, not for want of respect for lawful authority, but in obedience to the higher law of our being, the voice of conscience. Don't try this if you know you graduate and go to Bolt Hall and you're getting a law degree in your first moot court case. Don't say I am doing this in obedience to the higher law of my being, law of conscience. But in 1917 in the British court, you could say things like this and get away with it. And the point I'm getting at here is partly that I can't remember how much we've said about civil disobedience. Anybody remember? I'm sure we touched on it, but I'm not sure how deeply. What do you remember about civil disobedience? Carrie, do you have any recollection? In this class, yes. In this class, yeah. Um, it, okay. Okay, maybe we didn't, and that's fine. <coughs> civil disobedience or CD, as it's popularly called in the field today. Uh, of course, this, the language comes from a famous essay by Thoreau, which you have all read in high school or heard it on your iPods or however you access information these days. And uh, this has led to a, a one big misunderstanding that I can clear up very simply, very Straightforwardly, everybody thinks that he got the idea from Thoreau. He did not. He explicitly said, we had been doing civil disobedience for years before I read Thoreau's essay. So virtue, this is incidentally why I recommend that you get the Nanda biography because every biography that I've seen by a, uh, a gringo writer <laughs> has said that he gets this from Thoreau. Okay, which just irksome, but we're trying to cling to truth here. Even facts can be helpful. But that's, uh, that's where the idea comes from. Now, the way the idea works is that you have passed the stage of petitioning and you have to resist a regulation that seems to you to be unjust. Notice that he's saying that what he disobeyed was an order, not a law. And you're disobeying it because you believe it to be unjust. You might be wrong, but that's okay because you're not disobeying it violently. So there are two things that follow from that. You are going to do the disobedience openly because what's the point of doing it in secret? It's not going to get the job done, which is raising awareness that the law or regulation or what have you is not just. And secondly, this is where the, the sandal pinches a little bit. You're going to be willing to, uh, to undertake the punishment. 
So those are the two absolutely critical elements of real civil disobedience. There's, there's one other factor <coughs> that Gandhi will mention that in order for disobedience to be nonviolent, it has to be civil. And here he means civil in the sense of polite, as in civilized, as opposed to civil meaning the city government as opposed to the state government. So one day I was driving home late at night. This is in the days when I still was listening to the radio in my car. As some of you know, I don't do that anymore. But uh, there was a news brief from Sacramento. The state government passed a regulation that people had to register assault weapons because somebody had just tried to kill a whole bunch of school children with them. Somehow people felt that wasn't okay. So you had to register your assault rifles. They knew that there were about 6,000 gun owners in California who had these weapons. Not a single one had come forward to register them. And the commentator said, he was probably an NRA person was being interviewed. And he said, what you're seeing is massive civil disobedience. Totally wrong in every respect. It is not civil to keep an assault rifle in your garage. They were not doing it openly and they were not willing to suffer the penalties. It's just totally not civil disobedience in every possible respect. Okay. So but those, are, those are the rules for civil disobedience. It's a fairly serious thing and you don't undertake it lightly and it's not a good idea to do it before you have tried to reason with your opponent. Even if you think your opponent will not listen to reason, and there's quite a few of them we've got out there who <laughs> today have already indicated as much. Um, even if you think they won't listen to reason, it's good to give them the opportunity before you go and commit civil disobedience. So that struggle was also successful and his final comment on it is in the preface, hence it was that this age-long abuse that had been going on probably for 200 years, came to an end in six months. Very interesting insight into the power of nonviolence. And it's not that people had not tried to get rid of this abuse before. Like a hundred, yeah? It's right before the ultimate self-sacrifice of be, being willing to risk life, limb, and property. But you are suffering in civil disobedience because as you saw in South Africa, he was arrested when he was arrested four times in three days. And when one of those arrests, they, they forgot what they were arresting him for. They didn't have the charge. So he gave evidence against himself. That's real civil disobedience. You want the process to go through. Uh, because that will force the authorities to recognize what they're doing. <coughs> One of the books that Gandhi read when he was in prison in South Africa was The Apology of Socrates. And he came out of that saying, Socrates is a real satyagrahi. That really thrilled me, you can imagine. I was a classics professor at the time. And I already loved Socrates. But here's my number one man saying that he was a real satyagrahi. Now the reason, there probably were many, but one reason he would have instantly said that is, uh, in a dialogue called the Fido, Socrates is in prison. He has been condemned to commit suicide by drinking uh, you know, probably some uh, bioengineered product, rather <laughs> called hemlock. And uh, there was a soldier in World War I, incidentally, who committed su suicide by eating a tube of toothpaste. That's because of how toxic that stuff was. But sorry, that's a sidetrack. Back <laughs> even that was a sidetrack on a sidetrack. Let's get back to the first sidetrack, which is about Socrates. His friends come to him in the Fido and they say, we've arranged to get you out of here. You know, we've got a false mustache for you. Nobody will notice. We'll get you out of prison. There's a, a little cruise ship waiting for you in Piraeus. We're going to take you out to a Greek island and set you up there. Uh, Xanthippe won't go with you. <laughs> That's his wife. And um, Socrates says, I'm sorry, I cannot do that. In fact, he doesn't even say I'm sorry. He says, what's the matter with you guys? You know perfectly well I cannot do that. 
if I do that, I will be, it would be like hurting people in my own family. The city is my family. They have got to understand what they have done. If they condemn me and I wriggle out of it, they won't ever learn their lesson. So he stays in, a, in an Athenian prison and dies in order to show the Athenians what they've done to him. It didn't seem to have helped the Athenians a whole lot. They tried to do it to Aristotle about 20 years later. But, but anyway, he tried. So that was a case of civil disobedience moving all the way up the scale to the final sacrifice. So just – the, the important things are you cannot use civil disobedience for a violent purpose like keeping your assault rifle. In fact, you can even put that more generally. You cannot use nonviolence in a violent cause. The cause, the means and the ends are all in the picture. All the means, all the ends are in the picture. So you can't use a nonviolent technique for a basically coercive or violent end and expect it to work. And as Gandhi says, you can't, a thief cannot use his mantra while he's robbing you because if he uses his mantra, he'll lose heart and stop robbing you. So that's the very general principle. And in civil disobedience, that means that it's got to be civil in manner and in purpose. And then the other two very important things are it has to be done openly and you have to be willing to take the consequences. If you don't take the consequences, it misses the whole point. Okay, so this comes out in 1918 uh, in the Champaran struggle. No sooner was that over when he gets a call from Ahmedabad. You can imagine Gandhi getting – see, what would it be? The cow signal. You know, it's like Batman is always getting the bat signal. <laughs> Gandhi would always be getting the cow signal on a cloud above Gujarat somewhere. There's a suffering cow and he has to go <laughs> to some area and set it right. So uh, this is uh, Ahmedabad. I'm, I'm not pausing too long here to tell you what actually the issues were, what it was about. You may, you may want to get back to that later, but I just wanted to give you a sense of how the Satyagrahas developed the, the, the law of progression. In Ahmedabad, uh, this is an industrial city. And there are a lot of uh, textile mills and later on Gandhi will be against this whole system because he, does, he wants people leading a simple, materially simple life in their villages. But for right now, the issue is that um, the mill hands feel that they're being exploited. They're not getting enough pay. Uh, he goes to here as is usually his first move is always to go and collect information. Collects information, he arrives at the decision that their cause is just. Um, so he decides to help them in their strike. The strike goes on for quite a while. One of the neat side features of this is the mill owner, the main mill owner against whom they are striking. His sister is one of Gandhi's satyagrahis. So Gandhi actually goes and stays in the home of this mill owner. And then in the morning he goes out and organizes a strike against them and then he comes home, shares dinner with them and goes to bed. That's kind of an extreme example of how he's always able to make contact on the human level and separate what you're doing from who you are. So um, uh, he will go on a strike, which I, I'm sure we have mentioned briefly before. The strike was – aimed at, offered to, however you want to put it, it was offered to the mill workers, not the mill owners. That's, that's the important thing. What, why is this important? What's the law or the guiding principle that comes into play here? You know, the laws for fasting. Amy? Um, you have to appeal to the people who really care about mill mm -hmm. Right. That's right. If in the case of a tyrant, you'll only, you'll only be making him feel – you may remember that scene in the, in the Gandhi movie where Nehru is reading the paper and it says Gandhi's on a hunger strike and he throws it down and says, why do I have to read headlines like this? Uh, if you're 
against somebody who's not actually on your wavelength in some very important human way, it will be coercive. They'll only do it because they feel the public exposure will force them to. And besides, it just plain doesn't make sense, you know, to say – if you walk up to a perfect stranger and say, I'm not going to take food with you, it will not have any – they'll think you're crazy. If, you know, if you say this to your mother or something like that, it has a very different effect because you are threatening to withdraw from the bond between you. Okay. So he offers this to rally the spirits of the mill workers who are starting to – drift away, go back to work. They're hiring blacklegs. They're even thinking of using violence. And so to get them back on track, he goes on a three-day fast. At the end of three days, the mill owners capitulate. And he feels very awkward about that. This wasn't how the fast was supposed to work. It had a coercive element. But as we've already seen, Gandhi doesn't really expect things to go absolutely perfectly well in the real world. One of the little comments that the Bhagavad Gita makes about action, which I kind of regretted we didn't have time to talk about when we were looking at that theory. So let me gratify myself by bringing it on stage now, is the Gita says, you must never refrain from an appointed action because it is imperfect. You're, you're just not going to get perfect work in this world. I mean, in, unless you volunteer for my nonprofit or something like that. But by and large, that will not happen. So you have to use your judgment. How imperfect is it going to be? To share with you an example, I got an email from a lady. She happens uh, to have to been in Dallas asking me a question. She said, I'm so angry about this whole situation, what can I do about it? I said, look, I'm going to be in Dallas in three weeks. Why don't we meet and talk there? But what I would say in general is find some constructive creative work. So she comes up to me at the end of one of my talks and said, oh, I found a perfect thing to do. I'm going to go to Iraq and help the GIs. I said, no, Catherine, <laughs> no, this is not what I had in mind. So there's – we have to use our judgment it has to take the shape as, is this a minor imperfection which is sullying the surface of a basically good work or is it fundamentally flawed? So if you remember, he starts off saying, if they don't let me wear my turban in court, I'm not going to speak there. But in a couple of years, he comes back and says, you know, got more important things to worry about than a turban. Want me, they don't want me to wear it, I won't wear it, but I've got to come in and speak. So he – this is his first hunger strike or his first fast in India. And it leads to this kind of indifferent, slightly flawed success. Um, then there was a struggle in an area called Kheda, K-H-E-D-A. I'm not putting these on the board because they are in your reader. And I'm sorry about the people watching the webcast who aren't here, but we'll, we'll probably get back to most of these anyway. Uh, in this case, he felt that the people didn't follow him very closely and they came out of their struggle with the, just barely with their honor. Kada had not fully grasped the lesson of nonviolence. The mill hands in Ahmedabad had not understood the true meaning of peace. The people had therefore to suffer. And this is going to lead up to a big – what he's famously going to call his Himalayan miscalculation. You know, other people just make like Mount Tamalpais miscalculations, but he makes Himalayan miscalculations uh, around the Rowlett Acts. Um, so then the Rowlett Acts are actually passed in 1919 and it's basically the same as the Black Act. It, and the situation is similar. They've just come out of four years of a horrendous world war in which Indians had served faithfully and there was the expectation on their part that that service would be recognized. And instead, at the end, something about that military victory had only made the British mentality worse. 
and they clamped down on civil rights and so forth. <coughs> I've incidentally just been reading a book about propaganda and it's, uh, it's interesting. It probably won't be too startling for us but if you ask people about propaganda, they will basically start th – the knee-jerk reaction will be to think about Goebbels and World War II, Nazi propaganda. Would be really the only thing about Nazi propaganda was it was so obvious and they had an actual office called the Propaganda Office. I'm the Minister of Propaganda. Let me lie to you. <laughs> but, uh, actually, this whole practice that the Germans carried out with such horrendous efficacy in the Second World War was started in the First World War not by the Germans, by the British. So you, you practice untruth, it's going to spread and it's going to end up coming back to you. Cling to truth, it's going to spread and it's going to end up coming back to you. So um, the – in the course of the Rowlett Act Satyagraha, there occurs the Amritsar massacre. I'm going to get back to that but let me just go on to his seventh struggle. The seventh was the struggle to right the Khilafat and Punjab wrongs. The, the – as we say, the Caliph – of Islam who was in Turkey at that time was uh, deposed by the British. Shailen, you go right here. Deposed by the British uh, at the conclusion of World War I. And we're familiar with this pattern. It's one thing to conquer another people militarily. It's another thing to start messing with their religion. And the British are going to make this mistake again and again. They simply cannot get it that for Hindus or Muslims, you do not go in and say, okay, let us reorganize your religion for you, clean it up a little bit. That is always a horrible mistake. So the entire Islamic world is up in arms about this. And Gandhi threw in his lot and he was quite influential at that time, had the Hindus throw in their lot with this Khilafat struggle. Um, it marked the final sweet moment between Hindus and Muslims in India. Uh, after about 1920, Hindus and Muslims would occasionally cooperate because they knew they were both struggling for their freedom. But uh, the relationships are going to be souring progressively. And as we now know, because there's a kind of Freedom of Information Act for British documents also, as we now know, the British will be explicitly, deliberately playing off Hindus against Muslims. So they have to bear a big portion of the blame for the eventual disaster that takes place uh, with partition. And the Punjab wrongs were – was the Amritsar massacre. The Punjab is a state where the culture was always a good bit more violent than it was in other parts of India. Other parts of Min India, people might be uh, – they might be erring on the side of passivity, not in the Punjab. And so repression was always worse and the violence was always more aggravating in the Punjab. And um, and then this leads to the struggle to win Swaraj. It is still going on and my confidence is unshaken that if a single satyagrahi holds out to the end, victory is absolutely certain. So th those are the seven steps of satyagraha in the course of the Indian freedom struggle. I'm going to go back and start doing the first phase year by year and saying a little bit more about what these things were. But this might be a good place to pause, see if we have any questions. <coughs> yeah? Yeah. Okay, so let's go through them again. The first is oh, – oh, just – This is a, the name of a district, Viramgam. 
The second is the Immigration Act, or actually they're calling it the Emigration Act. The third is, and most famous one is Champaran. Spacing is a little bit wrong here. This is all on those pages 185 following, but uh, hey, no, no problem. The fourth is Ahmedabad. The fifth is Keda, again a district, and again it's mostly agricultural. It's about people who had a bad crop, wanted some tax relief, government wouldn't give it to them. The sixth is the Rowlett Act, Satyagraha. And the seventh was Kill Offense. And along with it, the Punjab problems, especially the massacre at Jallianwala Bagh, and finally Swaraj. Because after the massacre, the relationship with the regime with the Raj was forever changed. It had more of an impact on the situation even than the mutiny had had in the, in the 19th century. Okay? So, those are the steps. And you can see the first two, they, the mere threat of Satyagraha, the Champaran civil disobedience, Ahmedabad was a more localized struggle, but it, it involved the fasting episodes. Keda really was structurally pretty important because Keda is going to lead in 1928 to a somewhat similar struggle at Bardoli, and that is going to be a real uh, precursor of the climactic struggle, the Salt Satyagraha. What's happening is in Keda, as he says, the peasants, uh, they didn't quite get it. At Bardoli, they did, and that told Gandhi that he now could mobilize the whole country for tremendous self-sacrifice. So it's really kind of important. And the Rowlett Act uh, led to massive d civil disobedience and satyagrahas of every kind. And they, that feeds with the Khilafat struggle and especially with Amritsar, which is direct result of this, to the demand for Swaraj. Up to now, they've been just demanding some reforms. But now they're saying, as you saw in the movie, he said, he f remember there's a British official who says, well, you don't expect us to just leave, old man. And he says, that is exactly what I expect you to do. I expect you to leave as friends. And they say, but then you'll have all these problems. And he says, then they will be our problems. Not your problem. So I'm not saying that that conversation actually took place, but that definitely was the uh, was the lay of the land. Okay. So if there's no other questions, I'll go back and step through it again with a slightly different perspective. Because here we're looking at the buildup of Satyagraha per se, and here we want to look at the whole situation a little more broadly. Um, in 1915, which is the famous uh, big ears open, big mouth shut year, uh, he does get involved in Viramgam, but not very deeply. He's mostly just trying to re relearn. He hasn't been in his native country for 21 years. So he wants to get acquainted with it. And of course, he hasn't traveled around India very much. But uh, he also does another important thing, which is to found the Satyagraha Ashram at uh, Kotrab. So there's Viramgam is one episode and the Satyagraha Ashram. Satyagraha, I do know how to spell that word. And as, as I briefly mentioned when we were talking about the four communities, it's significant that he's calling them ashrams because uh, it, this is no longer settlement, no longer a farm. He's basically coming out and signaling to the rest of India, 
that this is a spiritual struggle and he is taking responsibility for it. You know, it wouldn't have made much difference to, let's say, the European editor of the Times of India, but it was probably electrifying for Indians to call that uh, an ashram. And you may – you remember the scene because it's in your reader and I know you've read every word of the reader up to the point that we're supposed to have read by now. But you remember that very stirring little anecdote that Pyaralal tells us how he met Gandhi. He was a graduate student renting upstairs rooms in an apartment and Gandhi comes in with these Punjabi businessmen. This is right after Amritsar. And they have decided that they are going to buy Jallianwala Bagh, which is the, the kind of meadow area where it happened, and turn it into a memorial. So these guys are the big funders. They're supposed to come in and, and pay for the purchase of the land. And they start hemming and hawing <coughs> and saying, yeah, it's a, it's a tough year. Uh, I didn't get the tax rebate I was expecting. So I have to arrange a wedding for my daughter or my son, so on and so forth. And so all of these Indian figures who are part of this, the struggle at that time, they come in and they make a pitch. You've got to do this. You know, our honor is at stake. Ball falls completely flat, at which point Gandhi very quietly says, this has to be done. This, the honor of the nation is at stake. If we do not raise the money here, I will sell my ashram. At which point they all say, whoa, no, wait, stop. I, I didn't mean it. Here's all the money. And he gets the entire sum right on the spot. So the, the, the steel determination and the ability to sacrifice rather than grab, that's the Gandhian combination. Okay. Um, so the great coming out, his debut is uh, in 19 – end of 1916 when he gives a talk at the Benares Hindu University. It's a ceremonial occasion and Ani Besant invites Gandhi to speak because he was still considered you know, one of the jewels in the crown uh, as far as the Raj was concerned. <coughs> but Gandhi has been traveling around keeping his mouth shut for one year and he is – I'm not sure what the nonviolent equivalent of this expression should be, but he was loaded for bear. How would you say that nonviolently? He was full of carrot juice or something like that. <laughs> anyway, he gets up there to speak and you see all these native princes with their uh, jewel encrusted turbans and every jewel he looks at, he says, that's a whole village suffering destitution because of you. And he sees the British, you know, with their fancy uniforms, uh, costumes, and there's nobody like the British for official garb. You know, if you've ever read that famous essay of Virginia Woolf's, Three Guineas, there's some photographs in there of these uh, British officials and how they dress up to the nines and then they put down women for being clothes conscious. Anyway, uh, Gandhi gets up there and he sees this and he, he loses it basically. He starts cussing these people out, saying, you're wearing the starvation of these villages on your costumes and stuff. And Annie Besant is – already has had problems with him over the Home Rule League. She's totally shocked and she says, please stop it and, <laughs> and nobody can get him to stop. And. Uh, this, this, so he – this is really a shock. This is Gandhi's emergence onto the scene in 1916. And that, I, uh, he is no longer – well, I know what we should call this. Uh, he's – he's uh, – he, he has outed himself. You know, he's no longer a closet revolutionary. He says, I am waging war against all of this stuff. And uh, sure enough, 1917 brings him these three quick victories. He is really on a roll. He's emerged onto the scene and he gets the indentured decree, the Viramgam thing at Katyawar and Kat Champaran 
all take place almost just slightly more than the space of one year. Um, so that leads to – well, let me get some of this down. This is the event to remember, the Benares Hindu U, the inauguration speech. And here we have uh, emigration, Champaran, and let's see, what was the other one? Yeah, over the Viram Gum. It, that – he was introduced to it there, but it was uh, – it was concluded here two years later. So three huge victories, I mean any one of which would probably satisfy a person for a lifetime, any one of which would get you the Nobel Prize for nonviolence. And he's got three of them in one year in his early 40s. He probably feels pretty invincible at this point. Um, 1918 is the Ahmedabad mill strike. That's the important event. His first fast back in India. Uh, and in 1920, two things happen that I would like to take note of. One is it's kind of off the main track. And it's not often even noted in biographies. But in 1920, there was something that was called the Keys Affair. We'll go over here. Get some of this. <coughs> the, the, the issue is this. The Sikh temple – at Amritsar, the Golden Temple, which you're familiar with from more recent events because there was a, uh, an armed holdout in that temple, which eventually led to the assassination of Indira Gandhi. Anyway, the, the temple treasury was a very important repository of resources and somehow the British governor of the Punjab decided that the Sikhs should not – could not be trusted with their own money. So he took away the keys to the temple. And the, uh, the population is a Sikh population, not Hindu or, you know, it's still considered a part of Hinduism, but they're Sikh. They um, illegally occupied the temple and sat there. They did not use violence. That violence was used against them. Actually, a pretty large number of people were killed. And because of that, in the end, the British lost control of the situation. They had to give in and give the Gurudwala back the keys to his own temple. At which point Gandhi sent him a telegram saying, congratulations, first battle in Satyagra in freedom struggle has been fought and won. So this was an important thing for him, again, to build his awareness of what he could and could not accomplish with people in India. It was, it was a grim event. People lost their lives and it's somehow not often taken note of because it's a little bit off to one side of the struggle. But it was the first time that there was a real head-to-head -head confronting uh, violence, at, at least at this level, since Amritsar. And the other thing that happens in that year actually is the Khilafat struggle and – comes to a climax and this leads to his proclamation of Swaraj in one year. He openly says to the people of India, we can get – we can liberate the country in one year if you'll give me your complete cooperation. Yeah. The Golden Temple uh, at Amritsar? Affair. It's amazing how money leads to violence. Well, this might think it's the root of all evils. Be careful. Um, K 
Okay, so this is really where he puts his whole capabilities on the line and says, let's go for it. Now, uh, for, for later purposes, it's good to note that what they're struggling for here is a kind of dominion status. So this is not porn swirl <coughs> for full independence. That will come really only in the 30s and then that will be followed by quit India. We just want you completely out of here. Uh, the way I look at it, uh, the British had a series of opportunities to see the handwriting on the wall and to do the right thing. And every time they did not, it got worse for them. There could be certain large industrial countries that are making the same mistake today, but that would not be part of our course. I won't dwell on that too much here. Um, in December of 1920, the Congress Party of India met in Nagpur, right in the center of the geographical center of the country from the end uh, – and so – and they declared uh, themselves in favor of Gandhi's program. So from this point on for the next 10, 15 years, they are his party. And between December of 1921 and January of 1922, there's not a whole lot of time, 30,000 people were jailed. So they did a little better than we've done so far. So 30,000 out of hmm, – how many people – what was the population of India at that time? It's just about what the population of the United States is now. On February 4th of 1921 <coughs> is the Chauri Chaura episode, uh, which was in the movie. We've got just barely enough time to discuss it. Uh, this is in a place called Gorakhpur, which means cow protection city <laughs> up in uh, – the United Provinces. Uh, there was a march and the march was uh, – it was a demonstration and march was being harassed by some of the police. The people got very angry, chased the policemen back to the police station. Not satisfied with that, they barricaded them in the police station and set it on fire. There being no sprinkler system, uh, I think uh, something like 24 policemen died in that horrible way, including the son of the police superintendent. And on this occasion, Gandhi was deeply shocked and he immediately declared a suspension of Satyagraha. Not the big Satyagraha, of course, but small Satyagraha. This led to a serious rift between himself and almost all of his famous close uh, co-workers like Nehru and especially um, uh, C.R. Bose who's going to later on lead violent resistance against the British during World War II. Chitranjan Das and other people, kind of famous high profile leaders who've been following him. At this point they are saying, I cannot believe this man's blundering. So really he is operating at a level where it's rather difficult for ordinary people to understand him. But it's of course his intense conviction that the ends and the means are one and you cannot use violence to bring about a nonviolent end. And I don't know if it was at this period or later that he formulated his famous uh, dictum that violent revolution will bring violent Swaraj. In other words, if you use violence to get your freedom, you're going to have a violent regime when you've gotten there. Okay, thank you for your patience. That was a lot of material and we'll take this a step further on Thursday. Are there joy? They are in my office and that's – you have that. And they are Tuesday 10 to 11 and Thursday 2 to 3. Mm -hmm. Village of Service.